Hi everyone and welcome to Real Life Talks. I'm your host Yvonne Heath, author of the book Love Your Life to Death and founder of the I Just Showed Up movement. So joining me today is my new friend, my special friend, um, Eva Olson. Hello Eva. Hi. I am absolutely <clears throat> delighted that you are here today. And um, I know we didn't talk about what I was going to share because I know a couple of things you might say, oh, you don't need to say that. But I do have to tell you that in my 27 year nursing career, I've met many incredible people. And in the last five years, I've interviewed hundreds of inspiring, incredible, determined, motivational people and by far, you are the most incredible person I have met. Be because of my age? Because <laughs> yes, you just get the prize because you are 94 years young. young, not 94 years old. And I say that you have a huge degree, a bachelor's degree from the University of Life. Do you not? You have learned a great deal. Yes, you can talk now. <laughs> okay. Um, when I received the humanitarian award from Lakehead, yes, I was asked to speak. Okay. Yes. They wanted the bio. They wanted that. Okay. I went up. My family were there, and that was the chancellor's dinner, and. Uh, my speech was this. What I see in front of me right now is a little girl thousands of miles away standing by the window crying. Why can't I go to school like other girls? Mm -hmm. But my journey has provided me with a PhD in life. Uh, Th absolutely. That was my yes. speech. Well, and, and it certainly has. Your life experience, you are intelligent, articulate, you are so wise, and um, I am just so well, honored that, that we met. Age. Well, <laughs> I've met a lot of people <laughs> that no matter what age, they don't really seem to be, they didn't graduate uh, from life because they got stuck in bitterness, in anger, in hatred, and you have to say your life has been challenging is an understatement. You have been discriminated against from many years, um, your whole life in one way or another. And I just wanted to start with the beginning um, when you were being raised in Hungary and the challenges then, because you, had, you faced much greater challenges, but they did start from the beginning. Well, they did actually, because I fought for survival pre-birth. Yes, okay. My mom and dad got married six months before the First War ended. Mm. And they lived in a winterized shed. In a shed? In a shed where the groundkeeper, behind the huge estate, where the groundkeeper, a young man, looked after the grounds, he lived there. But he was taken into the war. Oh. How my parents got that place, I never asked my mom. So now what happens, they married two years and um, my father's mother, before she passed away, was very upset there are no children. And then they started to come. So what I say even when I speak that they had no television those days, they had kids. <laughs> And they had a bunch of kids. They had three now. Okay. Sarah was four. Martin, two and a half, Regina, about six, seven months, she got pregnant with me. Yes. Doctor ordered her to have an abortion. Okay. And in the environment I was raised, abortion was out of the question. Right. So my mom stayed in bed eight months. Wow. With, with other little kids and, and no, it, living in the no shed. My goodness. electricity and no indoor plumbing. Wow. I, I can't imagine, yeah. And it's a big deal, here I am. The big deal is what she passed down to me, the legacies mm -hmm. that she passed down to me, I took with me to the camps. Mm -hmm. 
the legacy she passed down helped me to survive. Yes. Those legacies she passed down, I live with every day, even today. Even today, you honor your mom's strength and courage. 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 It took courage to stay in bed while you yes. had three kids. Yes. And compassion for the human life. Yes. And never to give up hope. Never to give up hope. So you took all of those qualities and you've lived them your whole life. Had she given up, I wouldn't be sitting here. You wouldn't here. be sitting here. Then you were raised, your family, your parents were had fundamentalist. very fundamentalist yes. in religion, re very, religious, very, uh, strict. very strict. And that caused conflict in your life as you... With, uh, huge with my dad. Yes. Because I used to stand by the window crying. Yes, you wanted, wanted to go to school. Wanted to go to school. And then I got spanked. Oh, boy. The more I cried, the more I got beaten up. And it was kind of sad in a way um, because out of six, then two more children were born after me. Right, yes. And out of six children, two of them were searching for a more liberal way of life. Yes. It's not that we didn't want to be who we were. Right. That wasn't the question. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be like you, like her, go to school, learn about people. You wanted to learn. <laughs> it's, yeah, you weren't asking for a lot. No. <laughs> and so my younger brother started to follow my, uh, my footsteps. Yes. And so the two of us used to get disciplined yes. very heavily. And the last time that I got disciplined was three months before I turned 18. Right. And that kind of severed the relationship. And after that, I never spoke to my father again, ever. Right. My mom, yes. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that particular day when I was beaten outside for two hours in the yard so the other kids wouldn't see it, my mom opened the kitchen door, I still see her, st stepped out and she said, Chaim Yitzchak, that's enough that's in enough. Yiddish. Yes. Just gives me chills because oh. I would have been damaged in my hip mm -hmm. from being beaten with the boots kicked rather mm. that I might have not made it through the yes. selection. So, so there was my mom again. Yes. So, <laughs> so challenging beginning and then the challenges with your dad being very strict fundamentalist and yes. so that caused a separation. So those were challenging years but then it became much worse. <laughs> On May 15th, 1944, right. was the day your life, your family's life changed forever. And share that, Eva, that hard well, day. We were liberated March the 19th. <clears throat> but March 15th, you went to... No, May okay. the 15th. Or May, yes, May 15th. Thank yeah. you for correcting me. May 15th, 1944, you were told... To pack our bags. To pack your bags. Right. You have two hours. Right. And you were going to? Germany to work in a brick factory. So you were in Hungary, yes. You were raised. Were still at home. Yes, you were at home. Everyone in, in your ghetto. village. In the, you were living in a ghetto. Yeah. Everyone was told you have two hours, pack your bags, you're going to work in a brick factory. Right. And you were stuffed. Everyone was stuffed into boxcars? Yes, about 100 to 110, depending how many children there were. Yes, and then what happened? There, well, standing room yes. only, four days and nights standing. Two pails. Two pails, one had water in for drinking for about 100 people. And the other pail was to be used as a toilet. Yes. And I had mentioned this a few times. All those years I grew up, I'd never seen my two brothers in underwear. Mm -hmm. And now you have to pull your skirt or your pants down and pee on sure. the pot. On in the front pants. of a hundred people, I mean, it's yeah. so... Yeah. yeah, it was... 
And then what is still there is my mom. And she found a corner in the boxcar. She was squatting down, mm -hmm. hugging my sister Sarah's three little girls. She passed away that year in January at age 24. Your sister did, yes. And she had three small children? Yeah, in four years of marriage, she had three children. Yes. And I asked my mom, why are you crying? She said, I'm not crying for me. I have lived. She was 48. Mm-hmm. And cry for all of the children. Right. Because she knew that something was not... She you, knew. She knew you weren't going <clears throat> she to work knew. in a brick factory. She knew because her favorite book that she used to read, she used to get up 5.30 in the morning, was the book of Esther. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also what happened when the Israelites were enslaved for 210 years by the Egyptian pharaohs. Mm -hmm. And we used to sit on the floor in a circle and she would read to us. Right. And her face was covered with tears. Mm. So she knew. She knew. So on May 15th to May 19th, you were on the box, in, the, in these cars, on the train. May 19th, you arrived. And it was not a brick factory. No, it was Auschwitz-Birkenau. <laughs> Auschwitz. Yeah. And it was not a brick factory. It was a... A killing factory. It was a killing 1. factory. 1.2 million were murdered. Within two hours of arrival, nine members of my own immediate family were murdered. Within two hours Within of arrival. Within two hours of you arriving. arriving. And this is part of what we know as the Holocaust, which many, not everyone even knows what that is because this we don't, we don't have these conversations enough. Destruction and fire. Yes. And so I, I, I wrote out or I, I printed what the Holocaust was a genocide during World War II, which Nazi Germany uh, systemically murdered over six million Jewish people, about two thirds of the Jewish population between 1941 and 1945. They were targeted for extermination as part of a larger event during the Holocaust era. And they also killed, murdered many others. Five million others. So when I present, I do mention that because, and I was asked, by, by um, historical society where I was speaking. I noticed you mentioned 11 million. I said, yes, because the other 5 million were people too. Well, this, and this says, taking into account all the victims of Nazi persecution, the death toll rises to 17 million is what this says. 17, not this is This is this what, is, uh, yeah. 17 millions of people. and. I, I mean, I just can't, I can't, there's no words to describe the horror that that means. And you were at Auschwitz where this was happening for yes. 11 months. Yeah. 11 months at age 19. Yeah. Well, people, there were people all around who had died and I just... I, I can't imagine. I wouldn't want to imagine. But you can. You, you can't. You have to be there to know what it was like. Yes. Yeah, that, you can't. That's the reality. You have to be there to know. Yes. And the fact that you survived is a miracle. It's a miracle. And my, my youngest sister survived with me. Yes. Two of you of your whole family right. survived right. for different reasons that because you were meant to share your message, something, um, it's a miracle, truly. But the day you were liberated, April 15th? Yes. 1945. 11 a.m.? Yes. Another small miracle out another of the small, ashes. Yes. And the reason for that is, or was, we were supposed to be shot three o'clock that afternoon. 
So you were scheduled to be shot. The rest of the prisoners, because they did not want the allies, to, allies, allies to see and to hear the stories. So they just, but a miracle happened in the British. Yeah, and, and the Canadians from Holland. The Canadians came and you were very near death. You were extremely ill. Yes, I didn't know then <laughs> that is such thing as typhoid fever. Hmm. I found out. Mm -hmm. So you were, where did you go from there when they, I mean, you were so sick. And I know at, even after the British soldiers died, thousands of, or arrived, thousands of people died because they were too ill. 14,000. 14,000. Yeah, they were beyond medical help. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you were brought to, where did you, where well, were you brought and to? And they converted, outside Bergen-Belsen, they converted the building into a hospital. Yes. And um, that's where we were treated, typhoid fever and dysentery. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because it was, I mean, there was lice, there was everything, every, they, people were treated. Yeah. Um, the Allies, the British actually, not the Canadian, sent in 90 interns to Bergen-Belsen to help. Mm -hmm. And what the writer says, this is Churchill's biographer, that there wasn't a clean, spot on the floor was covered with Eskimo. Yes. Where they put their foot down. I mean it just how you survived is is beyond comprehension. It's well, it's beyond it's here again could be some luck what meant to be. But when I think back and I often do that when lying on that barrack floor, because in this particular barrack where my sister and I ended up, there were no bunks or a chair. Every prisoner were on the floor. Right. Skeleton, very sick, thumb infection from drinking dirty water from the trenches. Sure. I'm not going to die here. No. I can't die. Yeah. Who's going to look after my sister? almost three years younger. That's what I kept saying. I can't die here. Wow. So that kept you going. That kept you going kept because you going. I had someone else to worry about. Oh, that's incredible. And there were so many, I, I, I know a lot of people don't understand, many people were murdered, but there were also many people kept alive for slave labor. Oh, well, there <laughs> were 405,000 slave laborers. 405,000 slave laborers. My goodness. 360,000 even though they were sent to the right to go to work. Yes. Died. Yes. Starvation, disease. Some died because they were beaten to death or worked to death. 45,000 survived out of the 405. It's, it's just, again, it, it just, it, it's so painful to, know that this was possible, that this happened, and yet it did, and you were silent after for, for 50, 50 years. years out of fear, fear. which, un, I mean, who could blame you, but then you well, chose. Well, what went to my mind frequently, I don't know who's walking on the street. Yes. Yes, of you course. Don't. But then at age, and I love this so much that at age 23, or that, that 23 years ago at age 71. Yes. You were asked to speak to, at a school to share your story? Well, what happened is um, my grandkids were at that public school. They knew who I was, but they knew I wasn't, I was you, silent. So they didn't even know and your this story. this teacher, she told my granddaughter, she was 12, that you should do a project and interview a grandmother on the war. Mm -hmm. okay. That's how she got around it. Wow, right. And so when my granddaughter came home and she told me about the teacher, 
Um, I said, well, any time. Um, so we did, she, I answered questions, showed her some slides, and when she took the project in, about a week or so later, I was called in. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought that day that my top of my head will slice off. It's one thing when you think about something. Yes. And it's a totally different feeling when you hear your words mm -hmm. come out of your mouth. Mm -hmm. Words you had not spoken. Yes. Of a horrific story, you were silent for 50 years. 50 years. But the nightmares were very bad. Uh, yes. I. How yeah. could they not be? Constantly hiding. <sighs> so, but that, when you broke your silence, started something, and you have been speaking the truth, your story, and honoring the that time in the your family keeping their spirit alive by sharing the truth the that's hard it. truth yeah yes that's that's what helps me to deal with it yes yeah to talk about my family and other families and one and a half million children just like my five nieces one and a half million and I actually saw a um, program on the History Channel. Um, some theologian and were debating who died first, the unborn infant in the mother's womb or the mother in the gas chamber. Mm. If the mother doesn't provide air mm -hmm. to that baby that's not born yet, that so, it's, but they figured the mother must die first because she's the one that provides the air. Mm. Yeah. Oh gosh, it's just so. And what also they were saying there is no way of knowing how many more children, and the reason for that is, I'm a product of that environment. Not all children are recorded at birth. Right. Okay. So yeah. they have no way of knowing how many more. Unbelievable. You have chosen, though, to take your, your message, and I'm just in awe, Eva, of you have spoken to schools, to organizations, to police, everywhere. For the last 23 years, you've written these books. Yes. Tell us about your journey with these books and, um, and tapes okay, and their the CD. First, the first one here is mm -hmm. my autobiography. Okay, yes. From early childhood, from the time I'm two and a half years of age. Yes. And why do I don't know that date? Because my sister was born then. Mm -hmm. And I asked my mom many times, my father took me to the hospital. I remember jumping up and down the stairs because it was not time to go in there to visit. And there she was in a little crib by a window and this and that. So I remember. I also remember when we moved from where I was born. I was two years of age mm -hmm. because the two other ones moved, were born in another place where we lived in two rooms. Right, oh boy, okay. Right, mm -hmm. still no electricity. Yes, of course. And the plumbing. And so, that's coming to Canada, and the war, and all, that's a documentary. So this, okay, and then this book here. That, yeah, oh, this the, one was next here? That one is okay. next. Okay, remembering that, forever. That, I went back in 2007 for the yes. first time with a filmmaker Auschwitz. from Toronto that has 140 colored photos. You know? Wow. And with Ron Jakes accompanied you. Yes. 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 And so and the filmmaker with his wife, Yvonne, mm -hmm. she was teaching nursing mm -hmm. in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And then this was born then. That oh, the filmmaker. So this is the film. That okay. 100 minute documentary yes. film. We first visited some schools in Ontario, 
and then went overseas. Wow. And so, so you have so the documentary, and then you and your wonderful son, Jan, yes. <coughs> wrote this book together. Yes. Yeah, Mother and Son Relationship. Yes. And it's extraordinary. So I, I listened. So you did an audio book as well. Right. I listened to the audio book. Yes. I cried a lot. I'm not going to yeah. lie. <laughs> I did. It's an amazing. It has 15 life lessons in it. Beautiful. From mothers, teachers. And teenagers. Yes, and you you are you've taught so many wonderful lessons and um, it has just been an absolutely um, extraordinary um, journey to listen and the choices that you are making to be a light in the world is absolutely amazing. And um, no, we're not gonna do it. <laughs> um, the life lessons are amazing because you are living an attitude of gratitude and love. Yes. And that is what you are teaching the rest of the world. And I am absolutely in awe. I am absolutely in awe. There's just so much more I want to talk about. <laughs> There's so much more I want to talk about. I feel like we're going so to have to do- a second half. There has to be a second <laughs> half, Eva. I'm, you know what? We are going to do a second half. I don't mind. Are you fine with that? Absolutely. My producer doesn't know that yet. <laughs> okay, so um, we're going to, I would love to do uh, a second half of yeah. this show because we have so much more to talk about yes. and um, you have so much it to does, share. So that is the purpose, <clears throat> the purpose for living. Yes. And what, even in the Durham board, a grade four, new Canadian little boy, visible minority. What gives you the energy to come here? And I said, you. You, because I'm doing this for you. And he went home, told his mom, his mom phoned the teacher and they let me know how excited yes. he was that because I was there for him. Just like the letter I mentioned, we can do that another time. Absolutely. What keeps me going is the feedback from these young people. Yes. Well, we are going to have uh, another conversation, Eva, because you just have too much to share to not do that. So uh, this has been Real Life Talks, and this is a show about learning how to be empowered and resilient, learning how to just show up for yourself, just show up for others. So my call to action is always plan your life, plan your death, and then just love your life to death. And always, what did I do with it? Here we go. Bring your own tambourine to the party. Thanks, bye for now. <laughs>